from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. You 
stood outside my grave with tears still on your face. Oh, I heard you say my name. My fear was turned to day. You came and I knew This is Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join Helen and I as we walk the steps of Jesus in Israel. We'll explore all the important biblical sites, from the shores of Caesarea to the Valley of Armageddon. Then we'll go to the region of Galilee and even have a boat ride on the sea. We'll follow the ministry of Jesus throughout Israel. We'll have the opportunity to be baptized in the River Jordan. We'll float in the Dead Sea and take a gondola to the top of Masada. We'll spend time together in Jerusalem, where we'll visit the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll walk the Via Della Rosa. And of course, we'll have communion at the tomb. 
For more information, go to www.newlifeoutreach.org forward slash Israel. We'll see you there. Spoken and it must be done. Hold on, Abraham, to the promise that he made you from the start. Don't kill your son, you've proved the circumcision of your heart. So go up to the mountain and you will see the His presence, and He will stop your sore. I do not comprehend, I do not understand how you would condescend, reveal yourself to me. Out of Egypt's land. Moses leads a people, Yahweh say, give them his commands. But to their idols, they are still enslaved. Now he's filled with rage, these people, they've been stubborn from the start. And Moses longs for the day the law is written on their hearts. So go up to the mountain And you will see the Lord His glory will pass by you Your idols are no more I do not comprehend I do not understand How you would condescend Reveal yourself to me The Son of Man has chosen few their faces on the ground, and the sight is grand. A voice from heaven tremble at the sound. He shines like the sun, the one whose glory was there at the start. Now dwells among a people who are hardened in their hearts. So go up to the mountain and you will see the Lord, the rock that they've rejected, his kingdom will go fall. I do not comprehend, I do not understand, the Lamb the Father sends, you became a man. Amen. How many know the devil's under our feet? I said, how many know the devil's under our feet? I mean, I know, how many know the devil is under our feet? Come on, man, if you know that, you need to make some noise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're training for reigning, so let's get our Bibles open to Psalms 105 today. Psalms 105. 
We're going to look at some of the Word today and continue where we left off for this two-part series. And we're going to finish it up today and then starting in September, after Dr. Mike leaves, we're starting a brand new series entitled Defeating Stress. Anybody got any stress? Anybody had any stress? Anybody know what stress is? How many would be glad to get rid of it? Praise God. Well, we're going to show you from the Word of God how to get rid of stress. That will be a brand new series starting not next week, but the following Sunday. All right, today, let's get to the Word of God. Today, it begins in Psalms 105, verse 17. Psalms 105, verse 17. And he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the reality of everything that you are to us and that your word reveals to us. I thank you, Lord, that as we study your word today, as we take a look at the perfect law of liberty, we will not be like the man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he saw, but we will be those who look into the word and take it deep within our spirit so that we will have a complete and total understanding and revelation that applies to our daily lives. I thank you for that today in Jesus' name mighty name and all of God's people shouted and the word of the Lord came and tried him now notice what it says there in your Bibles it says there in the 19th verse until the time that his word came and in the living Bible or I'm sorry in the new international version it says until the word came to pass and until that word came to pass Joseph was tested. We learned last week that just because you're anointed and appointed doesn't mean that you're going to be free from trials, tribulations, and tests. We learned some things about that last week, and we learned that once you become appointed and anointed, you actually become the target of the enemy to stop God from doing what he wants to do and fulfill in your life. And so you become that target. And then what happens is, as you become the target there, the word itself begins to test you. Now, let me help you to understand something. The word defines God's character for us. The word defines our nature. The word also points out what's in the heart of mankind. And so what happens is, whether the enemy is testing you or the word of God is testing you or, or, or whatever it is you're going through, God will use that to align your nature and character up with the definition and the defining factors of the word of God. So everything you've ever been through in your life up to this point right now, has helped define who you are and what you are and what you are to be. It has brought you to this place of victory that you still have survived. And all the threats and all the lies of the enemy against you have been proven to be lies and threats. Amen. Because had he been able to do what he said he was going to do to you, you wouldn't be here today. So you already have the victory. Somebody shout about that. So right now, whatever test that you have made it through, you have made it through to the point of victory in your life. We found out that as God uses the word to measure you, which is called a test, as God uses this to measure you, what we determined was that it was not to prove ourselves to him, but to prove his power in us. So that when we face these things, you know, boom, we don't collapse, we don't fall down, and we don't disintegrate. 
And what happens is the word, the tests that come against us through the word is relational to the fact of who we are today versus where God wants us to be. It also defines for us not how we're living our lives today and not where we are spiritually, emotionally, and physically today. What it defines for us is how God sees us. You know, when I look at Laura here, for example, I see her in a certain way. You know, I see maybe her faults. I see her, her personality. Oh, she doesn't have any faults. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I see her, but God doesn't look at her like I see her. You know, if she disappointed me or, or she upset me or she got me angry or whatever, I see that in her. God doesn't see that. God doesn't look at what we are today. God looks at what we're going to be tomorrow. Please say amen. And because God can look at us that way, now get this because this is important to you, because God can look at us as to what we're going to be, he can love us unconditionally. See, it may be hard for me to love her the way she is today, which I do, of course, and you know. But she may be hard for me to love today, and I might not be able to unconditionally love her, but because God sees what she's going to become through him, he can love her unconditionally. So when she messes up, it doesn't mess him up. Somebody say amen to that. See, when we mess up, it doesn't mess God up. See, it doesn't, God doesn't throw up his hands and say, oh no, I had great plans for her or him or you or me. And now look what they've done. God just says, well, that's just another step closer to the destiny that I am taking them. Please say amen. So the word looks at me and says, I see what you are today and the word being Jesus through his word and through God and through the Holy Spirit. I see what you are today today, but I'm not content to leave you there. I am going to move you into this. And he begins working on our character, our nature, our thought processes, and everything else in, in relationship to who we are in him. And one of the things that God begins to do is that when he reveals a destiny to us, then he's got to condition us to the place where we're ready for our destiny. You know, I was looking at a thing the other day, and I watched this, this guy on a car, in a Formula One car. I don't know if you saw it, where he flipped out. Man, he went up, and he walked away from it. I think he had a sprain or a stain or something. He had something very simple, simple in regards to that. How many of you saw that on the news? where that car did that flip up, man, it was incredible. How he survived is amazing. And for most of us, you know, we would say, oh, Lord, that's a miracle. No, that's not a miracle for him. He was prepared for that. That car was tuned up. That car was protected. It had roll cages. It had safety belts. It had head restraints. It had all the things that prepared him in the event that that happened. God is preparing us in the event that we reach our destiny. God is preparing us just like that car was prepared. He's preparing us to be what he's destined for us to accomplish. So when we get there, we don't blow up. We don't fail. We don't mess up because when we get there, we are talking, we are at a place where we talk like God, we think like God, we are where he has us from where he has seen us from the very beginning of time when we said, I accept you, Lord and Savior. See, these destinies that he's put into our DNA are only activated when we say, yes, Lord, I receive you. The moment we say, I receive you as my Lord and Savior, then the DNA that has been placed in us is then activated by God and the process of sanctification begins. And 
word sanctification kind of sounds scary because you think to yourself, oh man, he's going to change me all around. No, he's going to bring you in alignment to the way you were originally created with the original DNA that God had for you. Somebody say amen. So God just doesn't give you your destiny and then fulfill it. He takes you on the journey of developing you into the place where you're capable excuse me, capable of receiving that. Please say amen. In fact, the word of God, don't turn there, I'll just tell you. The word of God says this in Psalm 7, 9, for the righteous, God tests the hearts and the mind. For the righteous, God tests the heart and the minds. Say, what, what does that actually mean? That means he's bringing your head in alignment with your heart. See, because when you're born again, you're a creation, a new creation. Old things are passed away. So you got this new person living inside of you, but you got this mind up here who's still thinking like the old person. So God begins this process of bringing the two together so that they form one. Because when two are in agreement and touch anything, then they can ask it of their heavenly father. So with God, it's always about head agreement with heart, not you just having a heart transplant when you were born again, but your head still stays out here. And that process called sanctification is one of the hardest things that you and I have to endure because we go through all kinds of things that we don't understand why. Why we have to go through this, why we have to do that, why this is happening, why am I going through this trial? You know, Lord, I've been faithful to you all these years. I don't understand why I got to go through this now. Lord, I just don't get it. Who cares whether we get it or not? The only thing we've got to make sure is that we know that we are his and he is ours. And if that's the knowledge and the revelation that we've got in us, we're going to be all right. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to be all right. Turn to somebody else and tell them we're going to be all right. And so all these trials and these tribulations and stuff that we go through, you know what it's doing? It's really doing nothing more than testing our faith. In fact, God told me a long time ago, he said, the lengthening of any trial determines the weakness of your faith. The longer a trial goes on, the more you will stand in faith or you will lose faith. The more that that thing drags on and on and on, it will test your ability to stand fast on what God's word says. Please say amen. And so what he's trying to do is he's just trying to align you up with the rules of destiny. You know, we like to think that God gives us this destiny and then all of a sudden, man, it happens. How many know by now it don't work that way? How many know you get this picture of what God wants you to be way down the road, but he never tells you the road and the trials and the testings that you're going to have to go through to get to that point in your life? How many have ever been in a real serious trial of your faith? Raise your hand. How many know that when you came out of that, which you did or you wouldn't be here today, how many know that when you came out of there, you could trust God a little bit more than what you did before that trial? And God is doing that every day because this whole thing about trials and tribulations is not about us being bad or good or anything. It's about God proving his power in us that no matter what comes against us, and that's why he gave us the scripture, the scripture, no weapon formed against us shall prosper because greater is he that's in me. And I have to learn and develop my faith in the promise that God is my all in all. Please say amen. And I want you to understand something. Once you settle that, once you settle that I'm going to be with God, I'm going to stand with God, I'm going to be his child, no matter what, come hell or high water, I'm going to be trusting in God. Once that's settled, these battles and all this stuff that goes on starts to diminish in your life. Oh, they're still there. 
but the power and effect of them have no power over you like they did. And when the enemy tries to bring those same tests round and round again, man, the second time it's easier to defeat him because you already know the faithfulness of God. David said that. David said, look, I was out tending the sheep. And you know, uh, huh, this lion came out, this bear came out. I took care of him with God's help, and I'll take care of this same Philistine, this Goliath dude out here, the same way I took care of those. How did he take care of those? The same way you take care of your trials and tribulations. Amen? You trust God. So here's the first deal and the first rule of destiny. The first rule of destiny that we all have to get a hold of if we ever want to be great for God. And being great for God is subjective to what God calls great for you. I may wind up on television like this and reach millions of people. You may wind up reaching your family. Both of those have the same significance with God because that was your assignment and this is my assignment. Somebody say amen. amen. You intercessors that are here that pray and don't get any glory or credit for all the hours that you spend in prayer, let me tell you something. We may not recognize that, but God recognizes and that's as significant to him as the one who's standing here in the pulpit preaching. Please say amen. You know, you may be the one that takes a, a, a hot meal to somebody who is in despair. And that was an assignment for your ministry and your destiny. Not just that one meal, but you seem to have something inside of you that every time somebody's hurting, you sense something's going on. And when you sense that, you're over there with a platter, you're over there with, a, you know, a, a, a chicken, a roast chicken, some desserts, some whatever it is. You sense that in your spirit. See, what's happening there is this. You have decided to meet the first rule of destiny, and the first rule of destiny is I exchange my will and my rights for his. I exchange what I wanted to do, what I thought was going to be my, my dream, I'm exchanging it for his dream. So the first rule of destiny, exchanging his, my rights for his rights, is to have a willingness to exchange my dreams for his dreams through me. Now that's kind of scary on the surface when we start thinking about that and we say, well, I'm going to give up my destiny. I'm going to give up my future. I wanted to be a millionaire. I wanted to drive, you know, yachts or whatever. I'm going to give all that up. Yeah, because when you give that up, you will get more than you ever imagined. Please say amen. amen. Say it out loud. Amen. I was in the business world. And in the business world, I had really good positions before God called me into the ministry. And I was uh, a young man and traveling a lot. I was flying in private corporate planes. I was traveling with movie stars, and I was doing all this stuff, and, and having, you know, the time of my life, I thought. And then God called me. And once God called me, I didn't stay in penthouse suites anymore. They weren't good enough. Y'all didn't get that. See, I stayed in penthouse suites when it was my dream, but when it became God's dream in me, I didn't stay in penthouse suites anymore. I stayed in palaces. What, what, you mean you travel around the world and live in palaces? Yep, but not the kind you're thinking about. I lived in some of the houses of the most powerful believers I've ever met who could stand in faith through the worst storms of their lives. That was a palace to God. I traveled more, and in these years that we've been serving God, I've been to more places and more uh, experiences than I ever had in the business world. 
And so what God has done is he's not only fulfilled his destiny or is working to fulfill his destiny in me, he took everything that I had been enjoying or had been experiencing is a better word, he multiplied it out and took me to a higher level. Because now when I went to some place, instead of doing something that promoted a country, a company, I promoted a kingdom. I was a kingdom representative, not a corporate representative. Would you turn to your neighbor right now, tap them on the shoulder and say, you're looking at a kingdom representative. You don't feel like it today though, do you? You got a headache today? No, okay, sinuses, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't feel like a kingdom representative. Doesn't matter how you feel. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. So you're a kingdom representative because you have surrendered the reality of your dreams for his dream. And the reality of that has taken place now in your life. So as he says, as you say to him, look, I, I, I'm accepting you. I'm surrendering my dream for your dream, my will for your will. Well, what now happens is the reproduction of his nature in you so it aligns up with his will and his dreams. And remember something. He cannot do her dream through her. He cannot do his dream through me. He can only do his dream for her through her. And when she surrenders her will, she gets transformed into that thing that God wanted to create in her and the fullness of that in surrendering her dreams to him. His dreams now become the reality of her dreams and now she's got a better deal than she had before. Because here's what happens. When our dreams are manifested in our mind, the only way we can visualize those dreams is by what our mind can comprehend. See, I can see somebody who is a multimillionaire and I can dream to be a multimillionaire. I can desire to be a multimillionaire. I can see somebody who has a nice house or a nice car and I can dream or desire to have a nice house or a nice car. I can visualize these things and the dreams are limited to what my mind can visualize. The moment I surrender my dreams and my will and my desires and pick up God's will and God's dreams, his encompass not only what my mind can visualize, but everything that he can visualize. And that's why the scripture says, exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. See, what he's saying to us is, if you willingly lay down your life for me, your will, your desires, your dreams, I'll give you something that's so much better than yours, I'll blow you out of your socks. And I'll do that because my dreams are better than your dreams. He didn't say it that way. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. Are y'all seeing how all this scripture starts fitting together in your life? And now all of a sudden, you become, you become exactly what God wants you to do. And when that happens, an amazing thing happens. Open your Bibles up to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, we see what God says in regards to surrendering your dreams. He says it a little bit differently. See, he says, he says it in a way that we might not have thought of before, but listen to what he says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and we just want to read there in the first and second chapter. And it shall come to pass, everybody say, it shall come to pass. Turn to your neighbor right now, tap them on the shoulder so they wake up and say to them, look out, it's about to happen. It's about to happen, look at this, watch this. And it shall come to pass, in other words, it's about to happen, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments 
which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. Stop right there. Right away, our mind wants to say, oh, I got to do all these rules and regulations. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying to us this. It's saying, if you're willing to surrender yourself to me, that is hearkening unto my commandments. He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul. He says, when you do that, I consider you obedient to my dreams and my vision and my will. And the moment you do that, here's what happens in the second verse. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. You know what that says? Instead of your will being activated, you say to him, it's your will, not my will be done. See, that's what happened to Jesus when he was in the garden. See, we get that messed up. We think that this thing in the garden is he's trying to decide whether or not he's going to make it. No, it's not that. In the garden, he's saying to the Father, not my will be done. You know what this is saying here in Deuteronomy 28? If you'll hearken unto my will and not your own will, these blessings shall come and overtake you. And if you read all the way down the rest of this chapter, all the way down through the 14th verse, you'll see it encompasses every aspect of your life. It, is, it encompasses your mind, your heart, your spirit. It encompasses every area that will give you fulfillment and completeness. And all you had to do is say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. It's just like what Jesus said in Luke. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, let me read that. Just write that down, Luke, the 22nd chapter, the 40th verse and the 42nd verse. Listen to what he says. He's in the garden, okay? And he says to the father in the 42nd verse, he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. Thy will be done. You know what was really happening here? It was not actually, it was... It was the surrender of Jesus' will to the Father. But what really was taking place is it wasn't about what the Father was asking him to do. It's about his conversion from man's nature to God's nature. Do you know what happens when you say the same thing? When you say to the Father, just like Jesus, when you say to the Father, not my will be done, but thy will, you are in the conversion process of changing from man's nature into the Father's nature. You know what happened for Jesus after that? As soon as he said that, the very next verse says, angels were sent from on high to minister to him to prepare him, to help him pass the test of Calvary. I want you to know something. Every time, every time, every time you say, not my will, Father, but thy will be done, ministering angels are sent forth to minister to you and to take care of you and to strengthen you and to help you and to give you the victory over whatever it is that you're going through. The ministering angels are sent forth for the process of changing you from man's nature into God's nature. And what happens is that every time you say, not my will be done, but thy will, the same thing that happened to Jesus will happen to you. You will receive the divine nature of God in that area of your life, in that test, in that trial, in that tribulation. And you will be able to succeed in victory because you have said, my will? No, no, your will. You know what happens? 
that transformation takes place. I can remember times when it's a good thing that I said, God, not my will on this one, because I'd have smoked you from heaven. I'd have called lightning down. See, the disciples were with Jesus, and they said, Lord, should we call lightning down and burn these folks up? He said, no, you don't know whose will. He called it a spirit. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. What he was saying is, you're still operating in man's nature. I want you to move over in God's nature. I want you to realize how to face trials. Now, I know you probably never had any experiences where you wanted to punch somebody's lights out. You probably never had that, did you, Joe? <laughs> Silence is golden, Joe. <laughs> you probably never had some, you've never been on the road and somebody cut you off or somebody, you know, gave you a bad sign or something. That, and, and I'm sure you didn't want to ram your car into them and the only thing that kept you from doing that was not his will, but you knew that your insurance rates would go up. <laughs> See, every one of us experienced the natural man's experience and reaction to situations. I'm sure that there's been people that for two cents, you'd kill them or at least maim them, or at least break their knees so they couldn't walk anymore. Uh-oh, something's going on over here in this, this section. They're, ju they're just exposing themselves, and the rest of you are able to maintain your cool, so we don't know it's you too, but we know it's you. And see, so what happens here is, as his nature becomes a part of me, and as I begin to surrender myself, and in, in, verse, in the rest of the verses here, it says that he was in great agony, and there appeared from him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And as we accept his will, we say, not my will, but thy will be done, Father, that ministering angel, that divine nature begins to flow on us. And when that begins to happening, these ministering angels come. Now, how many of you have ever had a ministering angel come to you and minister to you and you knew it? Not one hand went up. Who? Ah, put your hands down. You're messing up my sermon. That's two out of whatever's here, two, three hundred people. That's two people that realized it. And Marguerite, I know you think a lot of me, but you don't have to call me an angel. <laughs> now listen, 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 listen. How many have ever known that you got through something a test, a trial, or whatever, through some outside influence that you never really realized, but you knew you had some divine help in that situation. See, here's what's happening to us. We're missing the ministering angel that God is sending to us. So today, I want every one of us to be able to see a ministering angel minister to you. Are you ready? Look at the person next to you. You just saw a ministering angel. See, we miss it. We're looking for this. But God sends people as his ministering angels. God sends the church as his ministering angels. God sends believers as his ministry angels. God sends people, flesh and blood. Yeah, there's times when he sends angelic beings to our, to our aid, but most of us never require that level of intervention in of our lives. What we require is somebody to come by our side and say, you're going to make this. 
I'm standing with you. That's a ministering angel, somebody who brings a pot roast to you when you just don't know what you could do. You're at your wit's end, and they just come and say, here, I just want to tell you I loved you, and they gave you this pot roast or this caramel flan or whatever it is they brought you. You see, that's a ministering angel to us. And we got to begin to see that in our times of transition from man's character and nature into God's character and nature, he will use all kinds of things and all kinds of people to bring us to that place of where he wants us to go. Yes, he'll show us the starting point. Yes, he'll show us the finish line. But that journey in between is the experience that you and I have to constantly say, not my will, but thy will be done. When you have to react to someone's, you know, offense, somebody's hurt, somebody's wound, will it be your will or be his will be done? When you're disappointed, discouraged, and unfulfilled, will it be your will or will it be his will? So you may go through all kinds of things and those tests turn into something called a testimony. Please say amen to that. And see, most of us think a testimony is about, is it a, about an experience. Most of us say, oh, yeah, well, I was broke, and God sent this person to me, and, man, they gave me a million dollars, or they gave me this, or they did that. But testimonies are not about experiences. Testimonies are about faithfulness of God. Amen. Testimonies are about you becoming Christ-like in the conversion process. Testimonies prove that your faith is developing. Testimonies say, I was tried and trusted. I was tried and tested, but I got through it because I trusted God. Last year, I couldn't trust him at that level, but this year, I was able to make it through because my faith is developing. So when we begin to realize that God is conforming our character and nature and a trial and a tribulation comes up, all we've got to begin to look at is say, it's just another step in the process of me becoming Christ-like. I'm in training for reigning. Bow your heads with me. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you today. Thank you for the power of your word. I thank you, God, that each one of us in this place today, right now, could be facing adversity, could be facing trials, tribulations. For some of us, the trial of our faith has been extended so far that we're afraid we're going to waver. Father, for some of us, we're not sure we can endure because, Lord, we've been doing a lot of crying. And we know that it says joy comes in the morning, but I've had a lot of mornings where I don't feel that joy yet. Every one of these experiences, every one of these moments, every one of these trials and tests, are bringing you closer and closer to the nature of the living God. And so, Father, we rejoice, not in those tests, not because of those tests, but we rejoice that whatever we go through from facing a Red Sea experience where the sea needs to split for us to survive to the place where we're like Elijah sitting by the brook alone, out in the desert feeling rejected as Elisha. Father, whatever it is, whatever place we find ourselves right now, whether we feel decimated, discouraged, destroyed, 
Somehow a ministering angel is already strengthening us. Somehow the power of your divine nature is overwhelming us. And somehow, some way, we're changing into the character and nature of the one whom we call Father. And so I thank you today that for each one of us who are in a trial, who are in a test, on the other side of that, their testimony will be not about the experience, although we will relate it through the experience, but it will be about your goodness and your greatness in us. And so, Father, I thank you today. I thank you today. I thank you today for who you are in our lives. Thank you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you're facing one of those situations in your life, you're facing a trial, you're in the middle of a test, you're at a place of discouragement, you're at a place where you need that divine nature to kick in and to overwhelm you so that you are not decimated or discouraged or destroyed, but you are at that place where God steps in. If you're in that place right now, stand up to your feet quickly. If you're in that place where you need his divine nature transferred to you, step up. Just stand up right now all over the place. Just stand up. This is your moment. This is your moment of transfer. This is your moment of transfer. You may not have any more answers when we're done. You may not have any different feelings that when this last prayer is prayed. You may not be able to acknowledge something happened to me. I felt something, but I guarantee you today, this moment, whatever it is you're in the midst of, God's nature is filling you and you will be victorious. Father, for every one of those who are standing, for every one of those who are in trials and tribulations and testings, for every one of those who are finding their own identities, who are struggling, Lord, right now to, to make sense of the situation they find themselves in, I thank you that right now the transferal process is beginning and that the fullness of your nature and your kindness and your greatness and your power is overwhelming them to such a point that they realize they're going to win this victory. That they realize that the fullness of everything you have promised them is theirs in Jesus' name. And I thank you for that by the authority of the name of Jesus. All the rest of us, let's stand up and let's just celebrate. Let's just thank God that for every one of the folks that are going through some trial, some test, some tribulation, that right now God is doing something in them. Come on, come on, let's praise God. Let's come on, let's just thank him all over. Let's just give him glory right now. Come on, let's stand with them. You're an angel that's ministering to them by your faith that God will deliver them. God will set them free. God will heal them. God will turn it around for them. You're celebrating. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I pray you enjoyed our broadcast today, and I wanted to let you know that our church family would love to have you join us here in our sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Our Sunday services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study and our blast zone for kids 5 to 12. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God, and that happens at 7.15 every Wednesday night. For more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of our great church, and you'll see what God is doing in the lives of our families. Until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.